I took brutal revenge. My wife decided to sleep with a co-worker right before our 20th anniversary. Hey, Reddit. Long-time lurker. First-time poster. Never thought I'd be sharing my own story here. But life has a way of throwing you curveballs. I guess I just need to get this off my chest. So, a bit of background. I'm Theo and my wife, Alara, and I had been counting down to our silver anniversary. 25 years. It's a long time, right? We've had our ups and downs like any couple, but our bond, it always felt special. Now Alara had this dream. Ever since we were young and broke, leafing through glossy travel magazines together in our tiny first apartment, she'd always pause at photos of Fiji, white sandy beaches, clear blue water, those little huts over the ocean. She'd get this faraway look in her eyes, and I could tell it was more than just a vacation spot for her. It was a dream. With our 25th year coming up, I thought, this is it. This is the time to make that dream come true. I wanted to see that sparkle in her eyes again, that genuine surprise. So, I started planning secretly. It took me months, saving a little on the side, researching the best resorts, and finding the perfect secluded beachfront villa. I even spoke to a local Fijian band to play our song as we arrived. It was going to be picture perfect. My heart raced every time I thought of the moment I'd reveal the surprise. Just imagining her face lighting up made all the sneaking around, the white lies about where the money was going, and the late nights of planning, worth it. It was my way of showing her, 25 years and I'd still move mountains for you. So, with everything set, I hid the tickets inside a scrapbook I'd made, our life story and photos, starting from our awkward first date to now. The last page was going to be a picture of Fiji with the caption, the next chapter? I thought it was cheesy, but in a good way. And as D-Day approached, I was buzzing with excitement. But, as you've probably guessed, things didn't go as smoothly as I'd hoped. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. That part comes later. Edit. Thanks for the awards, kind strangers. I'll update you all with part two soon. Hey again, Reddit. Wow. I wasn't expecting such a response to my last post. I appreciate all the support, truly. It's helping more than I thought it would. Okay, deep breath. Here goes part two. Work has always been my escape. When things at home got tough, or I just needed to clear my head, diving into a project helped. I'm in software development, and my team is a close-knit bunch. We've pulled too many all-nighters and tackled too many impossible tasks not to be. There's Bryn, our witty and sometimes too blunt lead designer. There's Jana, the team's caffeine-fueled coder. A few others, and then there's me. It was a Thursday, I think. One of those days where lunchtime comes and goes and you don't even notice. We were in the break room, me, Bryn, and a couple of others. I was talking about how Alara had been working late a lot recently and how I missed our evening walks. Bryn, sipping his overpriced latte, just casually said, Speaking of late nights, it's weird, isn't it? I looked up, a bit confused. What do you mean? Bryn shrugged. Alara and Lucan, they sure spend a lot of time together. More than just colleague time, if you catch my drift. He had this smirk, like he was in on some inside joke I wasn't privy to. Now I knew Lucan. He was part of Alara's department. We'd hung out a few times at company parties. Seemed like an all right guy. Alara mentioned him now and then, usually work stuff. They collaborated on projects, friends, right? But Bryn's comment, it just lingered. Like a tiny annoying mosquito buzz that you can't quite locate. I tried to brush it off. They're just friends, probably working on some big project, I said, forcing a laugh. Bryn just raised an eyebrow. If you say so, man. I wished then that he was just being his usual, trying to get a rise out of people's self. But as the days went on, I noticed things. Whispers around the office, glances exchanged. Alara becoming a bit more distant, her phone always face down. Had I been so wrapped up in my plans that I missed something so significant happening right under my nose? The seeds of doubt, as you guys rightly pointed out in the comments, were planted. And believe me, they began to grow, fast. Until next time, Reddit. Part 3 is a doozy. Edit. To those saying Bryn might have his own motives, 
I never thought of it that way. But trust me. The story only gets more tangled from here. Back again, Reddit. I've been going through your comments from the last post, and it's both comforting and horrifying to see that some of you have experienced similar situations. Let's dive into where the real unease began. Remember when things in life were simple? Like when your biggest concern was whether you wanted pepperoni or cheese on your pizza? Yeah, those days felt far behind me. The house that once echoed with laughter and shared secrets became thick with tension. It felt like trying to breathe underwater. Alara's phone seemed like it was always buzzing. Late night messages, early morning pings, more than I'd ever noticed before. And each time she'd subtly angle the screen away from me, or exit rooms when taking calls. The once open book of our life together was slowly being replaced by locked diaries. One evening, trying to rekindle our old habits, I suggested, How about we watch that new movie you've been talking about? She looked distracted, fingers tapping away at her phone. Who's texting so late? I asked, trying to sound casual. Just work stuff, she murmured, her gaze never leaving the screen. I took a deep breath. Is it Lucan? The way she looked up, eyes wide and a bit defensive, said more than her words did. Why would you ask that? It's just some project updates, she said, a tad too quickly, before changing the topic to something about the neighbor's cat. Late nights at the office became the norm. Alara, who used to rush home to our cozy dinner and movie nights, started coming home long after I'd fallen asleep. When she did come to bed, she'd turn away, diving deep into her thoughts, miles away from where I was. Remember Bryn's little hint? I felt like a fool for not taking it seriously. Every fiber of my being screamed that something was off, but I tried to tell myself that it was just work stress or maybe the looming anniversary was making her anxious. Yeah, I know, denial isn't just a river in Egypt. I confided in my best friend Jackson. We'd been bros since college. He'd been my wingman when I first met Alara. Over a couple of beers, I laid it all out. He listened, deep in thought, and finally said, Man, you need to talk to her. Straight up. No games. I knew he was right. But was I ready for the answers? Hey, Reddit fam. I've been dreading this part, but the story wouldn't be complete without it. So... Here's how the floor fell out from under my world. It was a Saturday. Our home, usually alive with weekend energy, was silent except for the hum of the air conditioner. Alara was in the shower and I was lounging on the couch, diving into some much needed gaming to distract myself from, well, everything. As I was reaching for my controller, I saw Alara's purse topple from the counter. Out spilled its contents, her wallet, some lipstick, random receipts, and a folded piece of paper. Normally, I'd never invade her privacy, but something about that paper caught my eye. The handwriting wasn't hers. I picked it up and noticed it was addressed to her, from Lucan. Elara, it began. My heart raced as I read on. Every stolen moment with you makes me feel alive. Our secret meetings at the park, the thrill of hiding from the world, it's intoxicating. When I'm near you, Everything else fades. How do you feel when we're together? I felt like someone had punched the air out of my lungs. Each word was like a dagger, stabbing at my very core. I read and reread the letter, hoping I had somehow misunderstood, hoping it was some cruel joke. But it wasn't. The undeniable truth was there, in black and white. A whirlwind of emotions hit me. Anger, sadness, disbelief. The room seemed to spin. Was this really happening? Were the last 25 years just meaningless? I heard the water stop, signaling the end of Ilara's shower. Panic set in. Do I confront her now? Do I wait? Is this the moment our quarter century together comes crashing down? I quickly placed the letter back amidst the scattered contents of her purse, making it seem undisturbed. I needed time to think. As she walked into the room, I could barely look at her. Every smile, every touch, every memory was now tainted with doubt. But I kept my poker face, not letting on about my discovery. That night, lying beside her, I felt more alone than ever. Sleep eluded me. The haunting words from that letter replayed in my mind, each iteration causing a fresh wave of pain. I'll leave this update here, Reddit. It's hard to relive, but you've been a great source of support. 
I promise, part five is coming soon, and you won't believe the confrontation. Edit. For those of you suggesting I should have confronted her right away, believe me, I wanted to. But sometimes, the weight of reality holds you back. Hey, Reddit. First, I want to thank you all for the kind messages and advice on my previous posts. They've been a beacon in a very dark time. So, here's how the confrontation went down. I spent days in a haze after finding that letter. Every interaction with Alara felt like a charade as I grappled with the anger and hurt boiling inside me. I played the scenarios over and over in my mind. But one evening, as we sat across from each other at dinner, the weight of the silence was too much to bear. With the letter clenched in my hand, I looked at Alara, took a deep breath, and asked, What's going on between you and Lucan? Her eyes widened in shock. For a split second, I thought I saw guilt flash across her face, but she quickly masked it. What do you mean? She replied, feigning innocence. I placed the letter on the table. This, Alara, what is this? She stared at the letter, her face turning pale. Theo, it's not what it looks like, she whispered, tears forming in her eyes. Then please, I said, my voice trembling with emotion, tell me what it is. For a moment, she was silent, collecting herself. We, we just became close, you know? We shared things, thoughts, feelings, but it was never, it wasn't supposed to be this way. I felt a sharp sting of betrayal. Shared feelings? What about our feelings, our memories? Did they mean nothing to you? Alara cried, I never meant to hurt you. It was a mistake. But her words felt empty, especially when juxtaposed with the raw emotions in Lucan's letter. She tried to gaslight me further. We're just really close friends, Theo. You're blowing this out of proportion. You always get so jealous. Close friends? After everything I had seen and felt? Alara, don't insult my intelligence. Close friends don't write letters like this. She looked defeated, avoiding my eyes. I'm so sorry, Theo, she whispered. But was she sorry for the act or sorry for being caught? The line between reality and deception had blurred so much, I couldn't tell anymore. That night, our house, which had been a sanctuary of love and trust, felt like a prison of doubts and broken dreams. I'll continue soon, Reddit. Writing this out is therapeutic in a way, but also so damn painful. I need a break. All right, Reddit. I'm back. Buckle up, because this part is, well, just read. The day after the confrontation with Alara, I felt lost. Part of me was desperate for an explanation, something more than Alara's half-hearted apologies. Lucan was the other side of this twisted equation. I needed to hear his side of the story. After some digging, I managed to find his contact. We agreed to meet at a cafe in downtown Boston, away from prying eyes. I remember the place was buzzing with activity, people chatting, the sound of coffee machines hissing, the clinking of cutlery. Yet, in my world, everything was silent except for the throbbing pain in my chest. Lucan looked uneasy when I walked in. As we sat down, he took a deep breath. Before you say anything, he started, I want to apologize. My face was a mask of anger. Go on, I replied curtly. He sighed, looking down at his hands. This, this started as a stupid game. Some friends and I, we, we had this sick challenge. He hesitated. To see who could get close to someone's wife, to see if we could steal them away. I stared, my jaw dropping. You're telling me my life, my love, was just a pawn in your twisted game? Lucan nodded, shame evident in his eyes. Yes, but it spiraled, Theo. It became something more than just a game. Feelings got involved. It got complicated. Rage bubbled up inside me. So, my 25 years with Alara was just a joke to you? Some competition? He flinched. I never meant for it to go this far. I should have stopped. But, as I said, feelings got involved. Feelings? I spat. What about my feelings? Alara's feelings? He looked down, defeated. I can't justify what I did. I messed up. The enormity of what he confessed was too much to handle. My wife wasn't just having an affair. It was a challenge for him, a game. A part of me wanted to lash out, to shout, to vent all my pain. But another part was just numb. I got up, 
leaving Lucan in the cafe, struggling with his guilt, or whatever it was he felt. The days following the cafe revelation were the darkest I've ever had to endure. Everywhere I turned, the weight of betrayal pressed down on me. But with that pain came a fierce determination. I was done being the victim in their twisted game. It was time to flip the script. I crafted a plan, one that had served them a cold dish of revenge. I called Alara, my voice purposefully cheerful. How about a pre-anniversary dinner? A fresh start for both of us. I'd like Lucan to be there too. Let's clear the air. She sounded relieved, perhaps thinking this was a sign I was ready to move past the betrayal. That sounds lovely, Theo, she replied hesitantly. The night of the dinner, I booked the private dining room at Boston's most upscale restaurant. I wanted the setting to scream special occasion. The irony wasn't lost on me. As the night approached, my stomach was a mix of nerves and anticipation. They both arrived, looking awkward. I greeted them with a smile, trying to keep my face neutral. Thanks for coming, I said, ushering them to their seats. They exchanged anxious glances but said nothing. After we ordered, I decided to set the stage. I raised my glass. To new beginnings, I toasted. They raised their glasses hesitantly. As the night went on, I regaled them with stories of our past, deliberately choosing the most intimate moments Alara and I shared. Every anecdote was a reminder of the life they were trying to tear apart. The climax came with dessert. I had prepared a special video montage. A trip down memory lane, I announced, hitting play. The screen showcased happy moments, our wedding, holidays, the birth of our children. Their faces grew paler with each scene. The video ended with the text, 25 years, was it all a game? Silence. Their faces were a picture of shock and guilt. Elara's eyes brimmed with tears. Theo, I... I held up a hand to stop her. I brought you both here not for reconciliation, but for you to truly grasp the gravity of what you did. This, I gestured to the screen, is what you tried to destroy. Lucan was the first to break. I'm so sorry, Theo. He looked genuinely remorseful. I nodded coldly. Enjoy the rest of your evening. With that, I left, leaving them to grapple with their conscience. Reddit, the revenge might not have been explosive, but seeing their faces, knowing they felt even a fraction of the pain I felt, was enough for me. More updates to come. Hey again, Reddit. I left out a major detail in my last post, but I needed some time to gather my thoughts before sharing this bombshell. So, here goes. Before the dinner, while my anger was fresh from the cafe meeting with Lucan, I had an idea. I sent him a text, acting as though I was more understanding, trying to see things from his perspective. Surprisingly, he responded, and we had a lengthy conversation. Unknown to him, I recorded the entire exchange. At the pre-anniversary dinner, right after the video montage ended, and the room was heavy with guilt and remorse, I took out my phone. I announced, There's something else I'd like everyone to hear. I played the recording. Lucan's voice filled the room, detailing their twisted game, his competition with friends, how it all started as a fun challenge and spiraled into something deeper. The raw confession, every word dripping with remorse and guilt, echoed through the silent room. All eyes turned to Lucan. His confident demeanor had vanished, replaced by sheer embarrassment. He looked like he wished the ground would swallow him whole. Alara, on the other hand, was in shock. It seemed she was unaware of the game Lucan and his friends had played. The look she gave him was a mix of hurt and betrayal. She had been played just like me. Lucan, why? She whispered, voice shaky. Lucan for once was speechless. The weight of the truth hung heavily in the room. I took a deep breath. I wanted all of you to know the truth, to understand the gravity of the game they played with our lives, I said, looking directly at Lucan. The rest of the evening was a blur. People were outraged, whispering among themselves. Some consoled Alara, while others cast judgmental glances at Lucan. The unity in their betrayal had shattered, and the tables had turned. I left the restaurant with a sense of closure. While the pain was far from over, unveiling the truth was a step toward healing. All right, Reddit, another update. This one is heavy. A couple of days after the dinner reveal, I found myself holding the two tickets to Fiji. 
A trip that was supposed to be a celebration of our love, now a painful reminder of what had been lost. My heart ached, thinking of the surprise I'd planned, the dreams shattered. I called Alara, asking to meet. She hesitated, but eventually agreed. We decided on a small park near our home, where we'd taken our kids countless times when they were younger, a place filled with memories of simpler times. She was already there when I arrived, looking forlorn. The vibrant, confident woman I fell in love with seemed to have faded away. Without a word, I took out the tickets, holding them in front of her. Her eyes widened in realization. Fiji? She whispered. I nodded, fighting back tears. This was supposed to be our special surprise, a reminder of our love. But things have changed. My voice cracked. It doesn't mean what it once did. She looked at the tickets, tears streaming down her face. Theo, I... I held up a hand to stop her. I thought about going alone, but then I figured you might want to go. Maybe Lucan would like to join you. The words came out colder than I intended, but I was running on raw emotion. I handed her one of the tickets. She took it, her hand trembling. The weight of the symbolic gesture wasn't lost on either of us. I'm sorry, she whispered, but it felt empty. Everything did. I took a deep breath trying to keep my composure. Maybe this trip will give you clarity, Alara. Maybe it'll help you find whatever it is you're looking for. I turned away, leaving her standing there amidst the memories of our past. The Fiji trip, once a symbol of love, was now a parting gift of sorts. Hey again, Reddit. It's Theo. I'm typing this from a small cafe in Fiji, overlooking the most pristine beach you can imagine. As the waves roll in, I can't help but reflect on everything that has happened. Fiji. I had envisioned this trip so differently in my mind. Warm laughter, the intertwining of hands, and loving glances shared between Alara and me. But the reality, it's just me, the vast ocean, and a heart trying to piece itself back together. The beauty here is unparalleled. Every morning, I watch the sunrise, the sky painted in shades of pink and gold, yet there's a void, an emptiness that can't be filled by even the most breathtaking vistas. Each sunset reminds me that another day has passed, another day where the wound is still fresh. I've met many people here, from all walks of life. A couple celebrating their honeymoon, a family on a holiday, and an old man, Mr. Patea, who's lived in Fiji his entire life. It was him who shared a piece of wisdom that resonated deeply. Sometimes the waves crash hard, young man, but the ocean always finds its calm again. At first I thought he was talking about the sea, but as days went by, I understood. It was about life, about love, about the ups and downs we all face. Alara and Lucan never crossed paths with me here, and while a part of me dreaded running into them, another part, perhaps masochistically, hoped to. I wanted to see if they had found happiness in their betrayal, if it was worth it. But as the days passed, the pain started to ebb, replaced by a realization. Our love story, as beautiful as it was, had reached its final chapter. Trust, the very foundation of our relationship, was shattered, and no trip, no amount of time, could piece it back to its original form. Tomorrow, I head back home, but not to the same life. I've decided to start anew. A fresh beginning, away from the shadows of the past. Where? I haven't decided yet, but wherever it is, I'll carry the lessons of Fiji with me. So, Reddit, this might be my last update on this chapter of my life. Thanks for being with me through the highs and lows. The journey's far from over, but at least I know I'm not walking it alone. Edit. To those who messaged with kind words, stories, and advice, thank you. It means more than words can express. Sometimes when you read about men that were cheated on by their partners, you can't help but ask, how does he feel? What did he do? I just know that he is going to end that marriage and find someone better. Most times the men do deserve someone better, but there's just one problem. Can they fully recover from being cheated on? Will they ever be able to trust anyone again? I recently discovered that my wife of six years had been cheating on me for three years with a random guy she met at our wedding and I honestly don't know how I feel or what to do. I am stuck between peacefully filing for a divorce and being on the 9 p.m. news for something I might do. As I write this, 
I am at a wedding, sitting on the bed while a bag of clothes is placed in front of me. I honestly can't still grasp the situation or how I had been so blinded by the love I had for my war that I didn't notice sooner. I need to tell someone what happened or else I might potentially lose my mind. My name is Greg Okoro and I am a dark-skinned 42-year-old, 5'11 male with married to Clara Aide, a light-skinned 36-year-old 5'3 female. Clara and I met at the shopping mall. We both stood at the checkout line when a man came from nowhere and stood of Clara. Being annoyed at his behavior, Clara tapped on his back in order to get his attention before asking him to move to the back of the line because there were people who were there for her. Now, as I had stated before, Clara is 5'3", and this guy stood at least 6 FD tall and looked down at her before responding rudely that she should mind her business and allow him to pay for his groceries. Clara didn't stop, but again asked him to move to the back of the queue and this really annoyed him because he soon threw his basket of groceries on the floor and was now looking at Clara, the way a lion looks at another lion who enters his territory. But Clara didn't budge, but I knew that if I didn't do anything, things would get out of hand. I ran out of my spot and rushed to where they stood, took Clara's hand and said, honey, let's go. They said that mom is in the hospital, which is a lie, obviously, before dragging her to the counter where the cashier quickly checked out our things. Before leaving, I hurriedly apologized to the man before dragging a shocked Clara behind me. After we had left the mall, she seemed to snap out her shock and asked me who the hell I thought I was. I calmly explained that I, if I didn't intervene when I did, the guy would have done something to her, and I reminded her that we lived in a country where our safety is not guaranteed by the police. She seemed to calm down after this and thanked me. We exchanged contacts before I walked her to her car and watched her drive off before getting into mine. That singular encounter changed my life forever. Claire and I started texting, meeting for innocent lunch and dinner dates before I asked her to be my girlfriend. She accepted and it was heaven on earth. I would always wake up to calls from her, surprise visits at house, home-cooked meals, more dates, but we never got too intimate. Clara came from a Catholic family and they don't take too kindly to such things. Her parents are Yoruba and also very traditional, so simple things like lying on the floor to greet them matter a lot. After dating for three years, I popped the question and she said yes. I was beyond happy because I have finally found my better half, my missing rib, cheesy. I know. The wedding was beautiful, and finally it was time to go home and start the rest of our lives. We waited a year before we started trying for kids. The reason for this was because we both agreed that we wanted to have that period all to ourselves and build our careers before we can bring a child into the picture. On the second anniversary of our marriage, Clara surprised me with a positive pregnancy test result, and to say that I was happy was a big lie. I was more than happy, and why wouldn't I be? I was married to the perfect woman and she was about to give me the perfect child. I always assumed we're happy. I worked hard as an accountant at Advise LLP, CPA firm at 6230 Wilshire BLVD Suite, Real 192, Los Angeles, CA 9048, United States provide for our comfortable life at LA. I trusted Clara completely and never suspected that anything was wrong. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Now, five years and two kids later, I start noticing some changes. Clara stopped sending me good morning texts. Yes, yes, I know what you're thinking, but even after we got married, she still kept the habit of always sending me good morning texts whenever she woke up. She always got up before I did to take care of the kids and get breakfast ready, but always found time to send me the cutest texts that would leave me smiling and giggling to myself all day. It was always something short and cute, like, if you were a vegetable, you'd be a cucumber, or are you Netflix? Because I could watch you for hours. But all of a sudden, the messages stopped coming. When it first happened, I just brushed it off and assumed that she had a pretty hectic day and must have forgotten. But when two weeks had gone back without any good morning texts, I knew that Clara had changed. It was as though she had stopped caring about me and our marriage. The only time I would see her brighten up would be when she's with our kids, but whenever we would be alone, she would be so stiff and uptight with me that every conversation with her feel like a conversation between my boss and I. I thought I had done something wrong and even went as far as apologizing and treating her to a fancy dinner. But even after all that, she still remained the same. She had started keeping late nights, 
claiming she had to work overtime or meet with friends. She became so distant and cold that she started avoiding my affection and attention. I have never questioned my wife and her work. Neither have I ever imagined her of doing anything to hurt me, so I always went with her excuses. We had to get made to help take care of the kids while we were at work, but I made sure to always coming back before they went to bed. I always assured them that their mother loved them because my eldest daughter kept asking why her mother was hardly at home and if they had done something to upset their mother. Hearing this from a four-year-old girl broke my heart, so I told her that her mother just had a lot of work to do and also reassured them that their mother loved them so much. Each time I tell Clara what the kids say, she promises to change, which she does, but only for a day or two. Now I am a very calm and quiet guy, but for some reason, I was slowly getting agitated by what was going on, but I never for once questioned my wife's faithfulness to me. I always blamed her work or something else for her behavior. I never stopped being a loving and devoted husband who secretly prayed that things go back to the way they were. If someone had told me what the following year would bring and how it would affect me, I would have cussed the person out. The following year started off different. Clara was back to normal and even better than before. She was always smiling and laughing each time I saw her. The good morning texts started coming again and she even added some happy endings at the end of the day for me, and I couldn't believe how lucky I was. I was also happy to see her spend more time with the children and she even started coming back from work early. It was truly amazing because at that moment I felt like nothing could ever go wrong with life. One thing that she also started doing the year was going to the gym at night with her friends from work. She went every Sunday and would return to the house some minutes past eight, but she was always in a cheerful mood when she returned, so I didn't question the odd hours. It suddenly changed from every Sunday to Saturdays and Sundays. I didn't mind because her attitude didn't change towards the kids and I, so I turned a blind eye to it. After six months of going to night gym, there was no visible change in her body. She was still the same and even added a few pounds. Not that I am complaining about that though. One day I jokingly told her that I would love to join her in her gym sessions and she immediately tensed up and got all defensive. She said, and I quote, you don't need to go to the gym with me. It's mostly just ladies working out and talking about their husbands. Upon saying this, it dawned on me that she had never told me the name of her gym or where it was located, so I asked her. She looked at me for some time before she said she needed to use the restroom. My fellow Redditors, the next time I asked about the name and location of the gym, she came prepared with even pictures of herself outside and inside the gym. The gym was Hybrid Gym, LA. After that, I left it alone, but I was still curious as to why she reacted the way she did the first time I asked her about it. It was our wedding anniversary and I planned to surprise her. I wanted to pay some people to follow me to the gym holding a cake, a money bouquet and money cake, as well as a saxophony player that was going to play her favorite song for her. I called her sister to help me plan the surprise as well, follow me there to capture the beautiful moment. Around 5 p.m. everyone was ready and we drove to the gym in my car. Luckily there was no traffic that day, so we only spent 30 minutes on the road. When we got there, everyone got into place. My sister-in-law started recording on her phone. I held the money bouquet. My Love by Westlife was playing on the saxophone, while those carrying the money cakes were at the back. I couldn't wait to see her face. Upon entering the building, we were met with many shocked and surprised faces, but none of them belonged to Clara. Thinking she might have gone to the restroom, I approached the receptionist and asked her if my wife had arrived. She asked for my wife's name, but after checking her records, she informed me that nobody by that name had registered there. I was confused because my wife had been going there for months or did I get the name wrong? I asked her sister to call her and ask her where she was, but specifically told her not to inform my wife of my presence. She left to make the phone call while I went back to the car with others. After five minutes, she came back with a strange look on her face, and when I asked her what happened, she told me that Clara had told her that she was at the Freehand LA, which was located at 416 W 8th St. Los Angeles, CA 914, United States. I just assumed that it was a work thing, or maybe her friends had lodged her to celebrate her anniversary with her. It's stupid, I know, but I always made excuses for her. I asked if she got the room number from Clara, to which she nodded and we were off. Now, I am going to be frank with you guys. Nothing, and I mean nothing could have prepared me for what happened. 
In all my years of existence, I have never had the privilege of wishing that the earth would open up and swallow me never to spit me back ever again. Thinking about it now makes me physically nauseous and stupid at the same time. How could I not see the signs? Why did I keep making up excuses for her? Why didn't I just confront her? No matter how many times I ask myself these questions, I never get a response. If I had done something earlier, maybe it won't hurt as much as it did now, or maybe I would have left before it was too late. I would still be sane and happy, but no, I chose to be the loving clown who trusted the enemy to take a bullet for me. When we got to the hotel, I told the receptionist about my plan to surprise Clara and even told her that we already knew the room number. She agreed not to call Clara's room and we went up. Again, like before, we got into position, phone recording, saxophone playing, money cakes, and money bouquet ready. I took a huge breath before knocking on the door. The door opened, and before me stood my wife in a towel with her hair wet. The moment she saw me, she froze, and I was about to speak when a voice spoke behind her. If that's room service, ask them to get us new sheets. We got carried away and messed up this one, the voice said. I recognized that voice, but I couldn't place it. Clara still stood there, not saying a word to me or moving. Before I could say a word, someone stood behind her in nothing but shorts. The moment he saw me, his eyes grew wide and his mouth fell open. It was John. For some backstory, John was my stepbrother. Same father, different mother, but you would never know because we did everything together. The day I met Clara, I told him. The day she agreed to go out with me, I told him. The day she agreed to be my wife, he was there. He was my best man at my wedding for crying out loud. I even complained to him when Clara was acting up and he told me she'd come around. He even had the nerve to suggest that he might be cheating on me with someone else, but I guess he was the someone else. The thing was, I loved John so much that I was ready to give a kidney and a lung if he wanted me to. And I always thought the feeling was mutual, but jokes on me. Ha <laughs> ha. I stood there speechless. Clara's sister had been able to snap out of her shock and asked others to follow her down to the car while I still stood there. I looked down at the floor for what felt like an eternity before I opened my mouth. How long? They both kept quiet. How long has this been going on? I shouted, which caused them both to flinch. They had never seen or even heard me raise my voice, so the shouting caught them off guard. Clara opened her mouth, but no words came out. Then John spoke up, a year after Amanda was born. My head shot up and I looked at them. What? I managed to mutter. Clara was going through some hard times. We met, had a couple drinks. One thing led to the other and we spent the night together. I wanted to stop, but I... Before John could say another word, I punched him across the face. Clara tried to talk to me, but in a fit of rage, I slapped her right across her face. What do you want to tell me, huh? You're sorry? Or that you were lonely? Or maybe I was never around? No, tell me the excuse you want to give for sleeping with my stepbrother for three years while you gave me hell at home for two years and some months. You'd come home with an attitude, refuse to spend time with the kids. Your kids is hate and nag at every single thing I do, but what do I do? I still love you. I make excuses for you to your kids. I make excuses for you to myself. I even complain to him. I point to John, who's holding his jaw. But what do I get? As I said this, I could feel the tears leaving my eyes, but I couldn't be bothered to clean them before either of them could say another word. I went back to the car, dropped off my sister-in-law and others, drove home, packed my things as well as my children's clothes, and took them to stay with my godmother. I just told her to look after them and that I would be back to pick them in a few days, but on no account should she allow Clara to take them. I promised to explain everything to her when I got the chance to. After I dropped them off, I went back to my house, got the gun I secretly bought as a bachelor, and checked into a small hotel. This is my story so far. Clara has called and texted me countless times, but I haven't said Q word. It's been three days since this incident, and I haven't moved from the bed since then. I haven't eaten or drank anything. Neither have I gotten up to take a shower. My head is still fuzzy about everything. Most times I think to myself, what if Ameka was not truly my son? What if John was responsible for the pregnancy? Each time I get these thoughts, I shake it off with the response that I was there when Emeka came into this world and that I'll always see and love him as my son. Update. 
It has always baffled me how someone could sleep peacefully after doing something so evil that the mere mention of it would cause chills. I'm still at the motel and it's been three months since I got here and a lot has happened since then. It's been a bumpy ride and I honestly still can't say how I feel about the whole thing. For those of you who might be confused or maybe this is your first time coming across my story, hi, my name is Greg and I am in the middle of a messy situation. Now for some context, I detailed what I was going through in my previous post, but I'll still do a quick recap. I had been married to the love of my life for six years, but recently find out that she had been cheating on me for three years, and you will never believe who she chose to sleep with. My stepbrother. I know it sounds hard to believe, and honestly, after all the while, I still find it hard to believe that was able to find myself in this kind of situation. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that you read about on the news or maybe watch on those YouTube channels, but here I am actually going through it in reality. Now my wife had been trying to reach me and my kids, but when she found out that she couldn't, she took a different approach. As I think about it now, I've just realized that she isn't the same woman I dated and fell in love with. Was she just hiding her true colors or were they always there and I was just too stupid to see them? Anyway, back to what she did that left a scar on my heart. I got a call from my dad one day asking me to come over. Now my dad is Nigerian and grew up there before relocating to the United States of America and, well, let's just say that we, my siblings and I, were brought up Nigerian style and whenever we were summoned, it always meant one of us had done something and was going to be scolded at. After I got the call, I sat on the bed and thought long and hard as to what might have caused my father to summon me. No matter how hard I thought, I couldn't think of anything, so I just accepted that I would only know if I visit him. The next day, I got up early and got ready for my visit to my father. He lived it, so it took some time for me to get there, but when I eventually did, I remembered why I hardly visited. Everyone was smiling and welcomed me wholeheartedly while my dad just stood there. I walked up to him with my hand extended for a handshake, but that was not what I got. The moment I got close enough to him, he drew him closer to him, hugged me, let go of me, and then slapped me across the face. Yes, I know it sounds strange, but it happened so fast that I couldn't process anything. Why are you such a disappointment? It's hard enough that you didn't turn out like your siblings, but you also cheat on your wife? I was so stunned I couldn't react. I stood there, hand on my cheek, looking at my father who was looking at me with a look on his face I had never seen before. He, he slapped me. My father had never raised his hands to hit us, so where was this coming from? What? I managed to blurt out after some seconds. He repeated his words, but this time he said it calmly, and after saying it, he sat down and looked at me, waiting for my response. Who said I cheated on her? I asked, while still looking at my father with my hand still on my cheek. My father took a deep breath, looked at me from my head down to my toes before speaking. Listen. Marriage has its ups and downs, and even though you had never done things the right way, I never expected you to be one accused of cheating on his partner, he said while looking at me dead in the eyes. I finally let go of my cheek and tried to defend myself, but when I tried to mutter words, he asked me to leave. Yes, he asked me to leave his house and to add a cheery on top of the icing. He said that I had to call my wife, apologize to her, beg her to take me back or I would be disowned by my family. I would be disowned me. I would be disowned by my father for something I didn't do. The moment I reached my motel, I fell on my bed and started laughing. I laughed so much my tummy began to hurt and before I knew it, I fell asleep. The next day I decided to go and visit my kids at my mother's place. When I got there, they were so happy to see me and as usual asked when their mom was going to return from her trip. I had told them that she had traveled for a work trip and since I had changed my children from their old school, I didn't have to worry about Clara going to look for them there. You see, my mom and my father had divorced and were living separately. They separated two years after Clara and I got married, but I never told Clara where she lives and I'm thankful for that now. After spending time with my kids, I sat down with my mom and told her what happened between her husband and I. She was surprised that I wasn't given a listening ear and was threatened in such a way. Mum knew everything that had happened between Clara and I, so she was able to judge the situation fairly. 
She asked me to file for a divorce and fight for custody of my kid, but I reminded her that doing that would cause my father to get involved. And since he believes I'm the one at fault, he would hire the best lawyer money can afford and take my kids from me. I stayed till 7 p.m. before I went back to the motel. Once I got there, an idea popped up in my head and I called my sister-in-law to talk to her. We had been keeping in touch all this while Ad she even told me that Clara had brought John home and fabricated a lie to their parents, which won them over. She also told me that Clara seemed different, but I told her that I didn't call her to talk about her sister and that I needed something from her. I told her what I needed and she agreed. The next day I got the nerve to visit my house and Clara. When I got there, everything looked the same, but it felt different. I knocked on the door and Clara opened the door. She was shocked to see me, but she immediately removed the look of shock from her face and invited me in. I sat down and she offered me something to drink, but I declined. After what felt like hours, I cleared my throat and spoke up. How are you, Clara? Saying her name while looking at her sent tears to my eyes, but I had to bite my tongue to prevent myself from breaking down. I'm fine. How have you been? You look pale. Have you been eating well? She asked me with a hint of concern in her tone. I didn't respond immediately because what exactly was I to say? I was fine? Of course not, but I wasn't about to let her see that. I'm all right, Clara. I've just been busy with work. Look, the reason I came back was because I stopped talking, looked her in the eye, then fell on my knees. Please forgive me. I'm sorry for everything that happened. I'm sorry for not being a better husband, for not paying attention, for not loving you more, for failing as a husband. Clara, please forgive me. At this point, I was in tears. I was sobbing like a child while Clara sat there and looked at me helplessly. After a few minutes, she got up and knelt beside me. She wiped my tears and said that she had forgiven me and that it was fine as long as I had realized my mistake. I had realized and asked her to let me back into her life. I also told her I had given them my blessings to be together and she was so happy. She started doing this little dance that always made me smile. I decided to move back in with her but as a housemate until I can find a place of my own. I also found out that they, John and Clara, were planning on getting married. John and I patched things up the following week and honestly everything was going so well. I brought the kids back and they were so excited to see their mom. Now I know you're going to ask me what has come over me or possibly call me the biggest simp of all time, but I don't care. Seeing Clara happy made me happy, and that was all that mattered. Everything was going great at home. Clara and John would go out and I would stay home to look after the kids. John and I quickly bonded again, and I was even made his best man. I still remember feeling like a girl who had been asked to dance, he told me about it. I helped with most of the planning and made sure everything went perfectly. Clara's parents have forgiven me for what I did to their daughter, but her sister wouldn't talk to me. She thinks I've lost my mind. What does she know? Love makes you do stupid things, and honestly, I wasn't even complaining. My father was pleased with my decision and even asked me to visit him any team wanted. The wedding was held at Hollywood and Suits Hotel at El Segundo Boulevard Gardena, and we would have a big reception at their beautiful hall. Clara and John let me handle everything, and honestly, after doing all that for them, I felt so peaceful. I found myself wondering why I didn't do this sooner. I even found out that Clara was expecting... I mean, she told me first and made me swear not to tell John. I was so happy she trusted me enough to tell me about it. One day I saw Clara looking worried and I asked her what the problem was. It's nothing serious, just pre-wedding jitters, I guess, she told me while looking at her nails. I took her hands, gave it a soft kiss and assured her that she had nothing to worry about. I had taken care of everything to the very last detail and all they had to do was to be there and be happy. She smiled, gave me a long hug, and thanked me. When she was about to pull away, we both realized that our faces were so close to each other. Without warning, she kissed me and, well, I kind of kissed her back. Now, before you hate me, remember that I still loved her, and I guess those feelings never died. She didn't pull away from the kiss, and when she did, she simply smiled and said, thank you, to which I smiled back and left the room. I felt so happy, I almost jumped up like a child. Tomorrow was the wedding, so I had to sleep early. <laughs> Life is not always beautiful, but when you have something to look forward to every day, you stop seeing the thorns and only focus on the roses. 
I had been so focused on the thorns that I forgot how the roses smelt, but not anymore. I was going to give life another chance, but first I had to be there for two important people in my life at the moment. Finally, the wedding day had arrived and Clara looked so stunning in her wedding dress. She wore a trumpet wedding dress with a long veil and a crown on her head while John wore a three-piece slim fit suit with Oxford shoes. They both looked like something you'd read in a storybook and I kid you not, I teared up when they both said their vows. The wedding ceremony was beautiful and now it was time for the reception. After everyone had eaten and enjoyed themselves, I asked John to give me some time to give them a gift, and he agreed. You know, I just love happy endings. They always made me smile, so I wanted to give them one. Now I had installed a big screen and hired a projector because I planned to play a slideshow for them. The slideshow started with a picture of Clara as a baby and then one of John as a child. That caused the crowd to smile and go, oh. Next were videos of Clara and John in cute moments looking at each other smiling and laughing. It was indeed a beautiful moment. Then a video started playing. It was of me smiling into the camera. I can't wait to see her face when we go there. It's going to be priceless. I know that things have been going roughly and that work has been hectic, but I still love you and I will always love you. I spoke into the camera before asking someone in front of me if they were ready. The next slide was a video of me in the gym with Kenzie looking around for Clara. Then it showed the gym receptionist informing us that Clara wasn't a member of the gym. Then I turned the camera to myself and spoke. Did I forget the name of the gym? I was still asking myself questions when the voice of Clara's sister was heard, telling me that she had gotten her sister on the phone. So I looked into the camera, smiled and said, let's go. Now, as you can imagine, the bride looks very uncomfortable in her seat while the groom is shooting me death glares, but I just smile back and turn my head back to the video. Now we had arrived at the hotel and we saw the receptionist talking to me. Then we slowly made our way up the hotel stairs. We arrived at the door and the saxophone can be heard in the background. As I was about to knock on the door, John stood up and demanded that the slideshow be stopped, but to everyone's surprise. My father told him to keep quiet and asked me to continue. Now, when I tell you that I had the biggest smile on my face, I continued with the slideshow and showed how I discovered about Clara and John. The entire room fell silent. Everyone turned to look at the newlywed and shook their heads. My fellow Redditors, I wasn't done yet. You see, I recorded our entire conversation from that day and it was shown. The next slideshow was about Clara. She was seen with an older man and they were being intimate with each other. I paused at the moment and took the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing? How are we enjoying the wedding so far? Good? Okay. Now, some of you may know me as the evil ex-husband who cheated on his beautiful wife and many of you hated me without even knowing me. I was even threatened by my own father because of her. I always wondered why, but guess what? Now I know. After I said this, I played the video and guess what? The older man in the video was my father. Yes, my biological father. I found out about them after I made peace with Clara and John. But let's go back to the wedding. The moment my father's face appeared on the screen, I think I heard someone scream, but at that moment I didn't even care to turn back. I was too invested in how good the video had come out. The next slide was a picture, or rather more pictures of Clara and my father while an audio recording was playing. It was Clara on the phone with her friend, and she was saying how she had gotten pregnant again for my dad. She further revealed that my father was the biological father of our daughter, and that she was just going to do it all over again with John and tell him that he's the father. The final clip had me in it. It was the night Clara and I kissed. well. We may have done more than that, and every second was recorded, but before it ended, a clip of John hitting on Clara's younger sister appeared. He said that he was only getting married to her so that he could take out a life insurance on her. He further stated that after he was done with her, Clara, he would come for her, her sister. After the clip ended, a little message popped up, happy married life to John and Clara. I hope you find what you've been searching for in each other. Say, I hope you like this wedding gift of mine.
After the screen went black, I bid everyone farewell and left the hall. I changed my phone number, took my kids, and left. I didn't Remember I said I couldn't understand how people could sleep peacefully after causing mayhem. I still can't because I've been sleeping like a baby since that day. I still have my kids with me and I'm currently with Kenzie, Clara's sister. We're not together. Yet who knows? Something might happen later. That's all. I hope my story was able to brighten your day.